Good evening, and thank you very much uh, for coming to Google. My name is Peter Wilson. I'm one of the engineering directors here in Kirkland. And I'm just going to introduce what we've been talking about really quickly. But before I do, I have a list of announcements we've been asked to make. Restrooms are located in the hall. Uh, we're going to be recording this and putting it up on Google Video. Uh, we're only going to be videoing Jan and the slide, so you don't need to worry about your lawyer seeing that you're on Google this evening. <laughs> so, but, but it's going to be on Google Video. Last week's talk is also up on, on, on Google Video. Um, while we're talking about Google Video, it's a chance to mention that that is one of several Google uh, services along with Maps, Talk, Sitemaps, Google Pack, which are developed here in Kirkland. And so after this, you feel free to hang out and talk to some of the engineers who, who, who are working on these things. Um, yeah, we have two events after the, uh, following this one, on June 21st, uh, we have a, an interesting study of uh, Orchid and Google, which is Google social ne uh, network environment. And then on June 28th, we have a talk about security at, at Google. So that's it for, for the introductions, sorry, for, for the announcements. Uh, today's talk, uh, the science and art of user experience at Google. Uh, from its incept uh, inception, Google is focused on providing the best and the simplest user experience. Uh, Jen Fitzpatrick is going to talk talk us through the art and science between uh, Google, sorry, behind Google's design process, and give examples of, of how design, usability, and engineering come together to, to create Google's unique culture and, and, and unique set of products. Jen is an engineering director at Google who runs uh, Google's user experience team, and so she and her team are responsible for the user interface design and usability analysis of uh, Google's many products. Jen's uh, also led the UI design, testing, and implementation of numerous features and changes to, to Google.com. Um, prior to that, Jen was an engineering director for Google's uh, AdWords and Intel Systems Group, and she joined Google as a software engineer and is a graduate of. Uh, Stanford University. So please uh, join me in welcoming Jen Fitzpatrick. Thanks everybody and, uh, and welcome. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, so as Peter said, Google's really uh, always focused on the user experience, really right, right from its inception. Um, and so today I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking you through um, how that philosophy took roots in the early days of Google. Um, and how we, main, uh, how we maintain it today, um, as Google has grown into much more of a global brand today, we have um, you know, many tens of products that are used by um, people in over 100 countries, uh, over 100 languages, um, and you know, by hundreds of millions of people all around the world. So, one thing that Google has always recognized for is the utter simplicity of our homepage. Why is it there more clutter there? Right? You know, Google has all of these products nowadays. Why aren't there links to more of them from the homepage? Surely the homepage is some pretty valuable real estate, right? Why, you know, why, do, why don't we choose to put a few ads up there and you know, make, a, make a quick buck? For a company that's grown as much as Google has over the years, its homepage has actually changed remarkably little. So, a little jump back in time. This is what Google's homepage looked like back in, uh, back in 1999. The story of the origin of Google's homepage is actually sort of an interesting one. As you probably know, um, Larry and Sergey were graduate students back, uh, back in the Stanford Computer Science Department, and they decided to spin out what was then their, uh, their research project and, uh, and form a company, uh, the company that's now Google. And so Sergey um, got, uh, you know, got the task of building, building a homepage for this new service that they, were, that they were putting together. And it turns out that Sergey at the time um, didn't know HTML. And he really wasn't all that interested in learning. What he was really passionate about doing was building a search engine, was building a product that worked. And so he put together the homepage that you see here, something very close to it, really as a way to get the service up and running as quickly as possible. In many ways, the Google homepage that you see today, in some respects, you could, you could claim that it was almost a, a happy byproduct of laziness on his part, right? Why go for the bother of learning HTML to create some, you know, fancy, polished-looking homepage when really all it needed to do was get people going on the way to searching for the information that they were looking for. So, over time, though, I think this, this white, you know, rather empty homepage became something of a much deeper symbol about, uh, about our philosophy of design at Google. And that philosophy is 
don't put things in people's way. Right? Give people the most direct route possible to find the information that, that they're looking for and to accomplish the task that they want. One of my, uh, one of my colleagues at Google, Marissa Meyer, is fond of talking about Google as a Swiss army knife. Right? Google is a tool that gives you exactly what you want, when you want it. Not everything you could possibly ever want all the time. Google doesn't overwhelm you with a lot of choice up front, but when you need the power, it's there. This simple attitude of not putting things in people's way has over time driven a lot of the decisions that we've made about the Google site and how it's evolved. We try to think really hard about what features we ought to include and which ones are we're really better off leaving out, right? It's always easy to add new features to a product, right? Um, you know, ideas, ideas are a dime a dozen. But we find that oftentimes what's much harder is to have the discipline to decide to leave things out. Right? So we try to ask ourselves if we're adding a new feature and thinking about adding a new feature, do we really think that this is going to be useful and used by a large proportion of our users? If not, maybe we're better off leaving it out, at least as a start. So even though Google, right from the start, was a pretty simple site, we realized that there was a lot we really didn't know about our users. Who were they? How were they using our site? What was working well? What wasn't? And so in January 2000, we decided to run our very first user studies ever. In typical Google fashion, we took a somewhat cheap and scrappy approach to doing this. So we um, took a couple of us on a Saturday afternoon and headed over to the basement of the computer science department at Stanford, armed with an armload of t-shirts and a handful of $20 bills. Okay. And we managed to um, get a number of students to spend an hour with us using the Google site and talking to us about what worked and what didn't. And we learned a lot of very interesting things. We talked to one person who, when we sat down and asked him to start doing a search, sat there, and then he sat there some more, and he sat there some more. And we're starting to wonder what's going on. And so finally, you know, we're thinking maybe he's you know, thinking really hard about exactly what search terms he ought to be typing in the box, you know, worried about you know, impressing us with the you know, sheer brilliance of his, of his search terms, right? Well, you know, this goes on for long enough that we start to get a little worried. And finally, we then we say, well, you know, so can we ask what exactly you're doing? He said, oh, well, I'm waiting for the rest of it. <laughs> He's waiting for the page to load. Never in a million years crossed his mind that that was all there was, right? And so you'll note today at the bottom of the Google homepage, there's actually a copyright line that appears there. That copyright line was first put there as a way to punctuate the end of the page, as a way to say, that's it. Page is done loading. Go on now, start searching. We learned a lot of other interesting things. We um, got a comment from one person and said, you know, it kind of looks like some random guy's homepage. Not exactly the impression that we were looking to convey for, you know, a young, you know, young startup company that was hoping to, you know, sort of take over the world with its, you know, with, with the, with the uh, wonderful nature of its product. We got a lot of feedback on the I'm feeling lucky button. We suspected that no one would really have any idea what the I'm feeling lucky button did. And, in fact, the study bore that out. People had absolutely no clue what would happen if they clicked on I'm feeling lucky. Um, but the interesting thing we heard time and time again was that people liked it anyways. And what they liked was it made us seem a little bit quirky. It made us seem a little bit human. It made it seem as though there were some real people behind the scenes, people with a little bit of personality, possibly even with a little bit of a sense of humor, who were there building and making this product work. And I think that's been an important aspect of, um, uh, of how we've tried to continue approaching and designing our products over time. Um, the, the Google logos that change on holidays and other, you know, and other special events are another great example of this. It's a way to show our users, you know, hey, there's, there's real people behind the scenes, right? We're, we're taking the time to try to, just for a brief moment in your day, make you smile. Right? I think that's something that our users have, have really appreciated. We learned a lot of other things. We learned that uh, we had lots of confusing language all over the site, confusing blurts of engineer speak. Um, and 
I think this is a great indication of something that those studies really drove home for us, which was that the people using Google were not the same as those of us who were building it. And that sounds like a simple lesson, but I think it was a really important one for us to, for us to see firsthand. And so we went back from these uh, initial set of user studies with a renewed sense of motivation to go out there and really start making some changes uh, to, to the Google site. Not huge, drastic changes, right? Overall, we had a lot of things that were working well, but a small series of targeted changes aimed at really addressing some of the issues that we had found. So I'll talk more um, in a little bit about how some of those early forays into in the user experience in Google really helped shape our overall, uh, our overall philosophy, philosophy and how those have helped translate into, into the Google of today. But before I do that, I want to make one thing very clear. If there is one thing that I believe has contributed more than anything else to Google's growth and success um, you know, over, over the past number of years, um, it's the fact that the product we have fundamentally works. And by that, I mean it serves a real user need. Google works because it puts people in touch with the information that they're looking for, and it does that quickly and efficiently. I think it's far too easy when you're thinking about user experience to just think about things like, do I have an interface that's clean and clear? Does it look pretty, right? Um, and I think those things are important, right? Um, you know, usability matters, it matters a lot. But it only matters if underneath the surface, you've got a product that actually works, and it works well, and it's meeting real user needs. And I think that if you don't have a fundamentally strong product, then your users are going to have no reason to keep coming back and using your site or using your product time and time again. And I think that attitude has been an important one for us to remember over time, not only for the user experience team at Google, but for everyone that's involved in building and developing products. So, oops. So, the user experience team at Google has grown a lot from those you know, early days in the, in the basement of Stanford um, where we did our first user studies. But, in many ways, I think a lot of the basic principles and, uh, and techniques that we use to develop uh, the Google UI are very much the same today as they were back then. You know, user interfaces are a very easy thing for everyone to have opinions about, right? I think that link should be blue. Well, I think it should be green. I think the, nav you know, I think the navigation should go on the left. Well, I think it should go on the top, right? Opinions are easy to come by, but how do you actually decide, right? And so one of the things that we try to do as much as possible here at Google is to really rely on data-driven decisions. Um, we do a lot of um, user studies. We try to rely on log analysis as much as possible. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how uh, we take feedback from, uh, from our user support group and actually use that in some interesting ways. Um, and um, we also, whoops, we also uh, really try to make sure that we are um, experimenting often. Um, we try to, you know, we, we oftentimes will launch products even though it may not be um, you know, perfect um, as far as we're concerned, but getting that feedback early um, and get, uh, getting feedback from real users who are using them, um, we find is, is really important. So as I mentioned, all of our Google products go through, uh, go through user testing um, at least once, um, often, you know, often several times. We, uh, we sometimes learn small things from these studies, things like a particular piece of wording not being clear or um, you know, uh, things like that. Sometimes we learn really major things, like the fact that the quality of our results for a particular product just really isn't up to par. And in those cases, we might you know, send the engineer and he's back to the drawing board and say, you know, we've got, we've got more work to do before this is ready. We try to focus as much as possible in our user studies on a few core things. One is really good observation skills, right? Working on um, observing what the users are doing and interpreting that to really understand what's, what's working with the products and what's not. Getting people to explore our products without leading them too much. Um, and, also really on, uh, and also really on good moderation skills, right? Being able to, um, being able to really not ask, uh, not ask the many questions. The one thing that we find is absolutely key is getting our engineering and product teams in and observing the user studies as they're happening. We try to do this as much as possible. 
Um, there's just no substitute, as I'm sure many of you, as, as I'm sure many of you have experienced, for getting people in there, watching real people interact with their product, and seeing what's breaking. And so we try to do that as much as possible. We actually just this week are getting our uh, our first uh, usability lab here in Kirkland up, up and running and fully functional. So that's one of the things I've been talking with a number of the teams here about is how excited some of the engineers are to be able to see their products being used in an easy and accessible fashion. So if there's one thing we learned time and time again during these studies, as I said, is that we're not representative of our users. I thought I'd share one, one small example of something that we, we learned uh, from some user studies. This is an example from, uh, from the, the, the Google Talk and Gmail integration. Uh, as Peter mentioned, this is something where a lot of the work for, the, uh, for this project was done, uh, was done here in Kirkland. So, in the Google Talk and Gmail integration, uh, for those of you that, that have used it, will recognize um, when you know when you get a message um, through uh, you know through Google through Google Talk, um, a little uh, a little message card pops up at the bottom of your browser window. So this was this was a, a, an early version um, of those of those little message cards, and what we saw in user studies was the fact that people would get these messages, and they couldn't figure out how to send a reply. You'll note there's no send button on these cards, and that was for good reason. There's, you know, these cards are pretty small. There's not much to be in real estate, and particularly, you know, for expert users, there's not, you know, a lot of need to have a button there, um, you know, time after time. Especially if just hitting return will do the job just as well. But what to do about this? We we saw in the studies this was clearly a problem. It was something we needed to fix. So designers went back to work um, and came up with a version two. We figured, okay, if people don't know what to do. We'll tell them. Type in the box and press the enter key to send a message. That seemed pretty darn clear, right? Surely this, surely this will solve the problem. But what we saw was that um, this big, bold, bright yellow message that was sort of screaming at them thought that you know so it worked for some people, but for other people they thought, well, this must be a pop up. Right? And so they wouldn't even really read what was going on in it, they would just hit close, right? Go away, stop interrupting me. Right? Well, that's not so great either, right? So back to the drawing board once more. And uh, the, uh, the, the designer came up with uh, this approach, uh, which is a, a, a more subtle treatment, you might claim, um, and is in fact very similar to, uh, to, to what you see in the podcast live today. And in fact, when we tested this in the lab, we saw that it worked much, much better. I mentioned that we also do a lot of log analysis to, uh, to, to check with what's going on with our products. Um, there's a great example of this um, that has to do with Google's uh, spelling suggestions. So any of you who ever you know, done a search on Google, typed in a word, you know, accidentally misspelled it, you know, Google will come back with a spelling correction and say, you know, did you mean you know, give, you the, the, give you the correct spelling? So initially, we had a, um, we had a spelling correction uh, uh, service that was based on some third-party data, and um, quite frankly, the, the quality just wasn't very good. Right? So as an example, you could type in, you know, you could type in TurboTax and try and search for that, and it would come back and very politely say, did you mean Turbot apps? Well, no, not so much. <laughs> so the first thing we did was, you know, um, we, uh, we, we, we went to our engineering and we said, you know, we, we, we've got to fix this, right? We've got to build a better cell connector. So um, sure enough, several months later, uh, this, this little engineering team comes back and they said, okay, we've, we've got a better spelling corrector. Um, and uh, they, they did this by taking into account um, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the context that you can get by, by looking at the web um, and, and the data that's there. And in fact, came out with a, with a spelling corrector that's really pretty amazing in terms, of, in terms of its overall quality. And so we said, well, this seems great. Let's, let's launch this. This seems a lot better. So we rolled that out and almost overnight, the click-through rate on those spelling suggestions doubled. Remember what I said about that? You have to have a good product first and foremost. That was certainly a that, that was certainly a, a, a case in point. But as we went through and we looked at the logs and we looked at what was really happening, we were still seeing an awful lot of cases where people were typing in misspelled words and not clicking on that spelling correction. And we know when this happens that people are probably not having a very good experience, right? They're probably getting a bunch of lower quality search results because they're, they're, they're looking for a misspelled word. So we thought, okay, what can, what can we do about this? And we started looking at UI changes. <clears throat> so the first thing we did was, oops, the first thing we did was we made it big and we made it red, okay? It seemed like a good way to get people to notice it. So 
we rolled out this version of the UI, and surprisingly enough, the click-through doubles again. Okay? So UI changes can also have an impact. But we're looking at the logs, and we're still seeing a lot of instances of, of people misspelling. So on a hunch, we went ahead and repeated the spelling suggestion at the bottom of the page. And this is the one that really surprised us. The click-through rate doubled again. Okay? And so this is an example of really doing some careful analysis of what people are doing with a particular feature you know, in, you know, in, particular, uh, in particular situations, and really using a lot of log data to support the need for more and more change. Um, and uh, it, it turns out that by, you know, by having this, uh, by having this value suggestion duplicated on the page, we wound up getting up to, you know, to, to more usage behavior like, you know, like, like we expected, given the high quality that we knew the bot had. I mentioned using customer support feedback. Um, we found that paying really close attention to the emails that come into our customer support queues can be a surprisingly good source of insight uh, about what's going on with our users. Now, you have to take user support input with a heavy grain of salt, right? People are pretty good about writing in and complaining about things, telling you, uh, telling you when things are going wrong, telling you when they're unhappy. Um, they're not necessarily so great about writing in um, and giving you glowing praise just because something's working exactly the way they expected it to, right? Um, but we do sometimes get love letters as well. My, my, my personal favorite, um, this is from, from quite a while back, but um, there's a man who took the time to write into uh, to, to Google's uh, user support about the fact that several days back he had um, started feeling chest pains. Didn't really know what was going on. So he turned over to his computer, typed in heart attack symptoms into Google, discovered that he was in fact having a heart attack, called 911, <laughs> got him to take him to the hospital, and they told him on the way that if he had been a few minutes later in calling, he probably would have been dead. So he took the time to write to us and say, oh, you saved my life. Now, that's a pretty fun email to get, let me tell you. But um, anyhow, generally speaking, uh, users take the time to write in uh, write into us when they're finding Google lacking in some way. Sometimes they write to tell us about features that they really want to see. Um, when we launched Google News, for example, um, by far the biggest request that we got from our users was they said, well, you know, this is, this is a great product, it's really useful, but what I really want is I want the ability to customize this news page to my own usage somehow. Um, and that was a very consistent refrain that we heard from our users. And so, sure enough, that became one of the features that we really prioritized. And if you go to Google News today, there are, um, you know, there, there is the ability for people to, you know, customize, uh, you know, customize the page, create their own custom, custom section. We also get feedback when we accidentally have bugs on the site. Yes, that does happen from time to time. Um, and our user support teams know that if they see complaints spiking about a particular issue, um, they better go ahead and warn the engineering teams very quickly that they have something they need to look into. Um, and in fact, what we found is that this sort of user support uh, feedback when things are going wrong has been so important that in many cases we've created very direct links from the user support folks to um, our uh, product and engineering teams because they act as a very, very effective early warning system for us. There's a great example of uh, customer support feedback uh, that, I'll, that I'll mention quickly that comes from the, uh, the, the Gmail world. Uh, anyone out there use Gmail? Maybe? Yeah, yeah, a few, few hands. Um, so when we launched Gmail, we knew that there were some things that we were doing differently than uh, other, other email services out there. Um, you know, we were doing these threaded conversations, um, all sorts of, you know, crazy Ajax madness. Um, we were um, giving users so much storage that they would never need to delete another email. Okay. And we technically gave people a bit to delete email, right? It was in that drop down into the says more actions. But we figured there wasn't much need to make it more prominent than that, right? After all, you don't ever need to delete email. Why do you need a big button to, you know, let you let you do it? Well, yeah, we were. <laughs> Turns out that um, not only did people write in in spades to tell us how much they wanted a delete button in Gmail, 
find anyone at Google who's ever worked as a member of the Gmail team, and they will tell you stories about their family, their friends, random strangers they would meet at parties when they would tell them that they worked on Gmail. The common refrain was, I want a delete button. Don't you get it? I want a delete button. And so that was an instance where we, where we, you know, where, where we finally really did uh, listen to our users, and sure enough, introduced the delete button back into, back into Gmail. Over, over the years, our, um, our user experience toolkit at Google has, has certainly expanded. Um, so, for example, we now have, uh, we now have an eye tracker that we use to, um, for, uh, for certain changes, you know, track um, you know, eye gaze movements when people are using various products and, and use that to, to, to gain insight uh, into, into what's working and not. We've expanded into doing uh, more early stage user research for some of our projects. Um, and I certainly expect that over, you know, over the coming years, our, our, our toolkit, so to speak, will continue to expand and grow and change. But I think that the core set of tools that we use, really, the, the philosophy behind how we approach user experience, um, has stayed remarkably consistent um, over, over the years. One um, core principle that we really try to maintain, as I mentioned, is that we, we expect not to get things right on the first try. Right? I think that's really one of the most powerful things about the web, right? Unlike the world of shrink wrap software where you can, you know, build a product and you have to, um, you know, sort of uh, build and test and iterate for, um, you know, for, for months or perhaps years on end, but then when you launch it, that's it. There's no pulling back. There's this great thing about the web that you can launch something and you can learn from that launch about what works and about what doesn't. And then you can change things and you can iterate. Um, and that's something that, we really try to make use of. Google Labs is one place that we um, that we really try to use as an environment to take some of our earlier stage ideas, take some of the things that we know might not be perfect quite yet, but to put them out there in the hands of our users and to say, hey, try this out, give us feedback.